Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Charles Ogletree. I'm a Jesse Clemico Professor of Law here at Harvard Law School. Uh, I'm very happy to, uh, in a sense, moderate this wonderful discussion about, uh, I think, one of the greatest leaders uh, of the 20th century, Nelson Mandela. Uh, and we have five people who are going to be talking about him. I'm going to go to my, my right and your left and have them introduce themselves and say a word about Nelson Mandela. Let me say a few words about him and my relationship with him uh, to uh, start this and introduce this. And, and we will, in the formal session, uh, right at 1, 8, 1 p.m., because people have to go to class or go other places. Uh, and if you have questions that, that weren't answered, if you want to come down and meet the panelists, I think they'll be here for a few minutes after 1 if you want to come down. And we'll turn the mics off, too, so you'll know that as well. Uh, I met uh, Nelson Mandela before he was president of the Republic of South Africa. Uh, I was there uh, as part of a delegation of uh, people uh, and met him uh, when he was released uh, from prison after serving 27 years uh, at Robben Island, uh, a remarkable place and a remarkable resilience that he had. And I also met uh, Winnie Mandela uh, when he was still married to Winnie Mandela. Uh, and even then, uh, uh, being released, he had the same sort of resilience and, and excitement about uh, South Africa. Uh, and it was uh, two years later uh, that he announced that he's going to run for president. And as you may recall, he was elected uh, not as the first African president, but the first democratically elected president because everybody voted. And I remember seeing the ballot, and it's, it's worth taking a look at it. Uh, we don't have it here, but it's worth taking a look because there were so many different languages uh, in South Africa uh, and so many different dialogues that people were speaking that in order to make sure that everyone understood who they were voting for, there was a photograph of the person uh, and the party that they were uh, being supported by. And you'll hear some of this from the panelists, no question about that. Uh, and he was overwhelmingly elected. And he also said at the beginning uh, two things that were are significant even today. Number one, that he was not going to run for a second term. When do you think of a president ever saying, I'm not running for a second term? Well, he said that, and he didn't run. Uh, but it was the first four years he wanted to make that happen. Uh, and the second thing uh, that caused a lot of consternation uh, in South Africa, consternation in South Africa, was that his view was, uh, as the head of South Africa, is that uh, even though the majority of Africans in South Africa were black uh, and they weren't in running the government, his uh, objective was to have a multiracial uh, and multigender group of people working for him. And that created a lot of animosity among Africans who were from South Africa, saying, so, you know, we have been waiting for decades. Uh, Madiba, as they called him, uh, to run South Africa, and we're the majority. And now you're telling us that we can't? Uh, and uh, it, it also was very clear, as you'll hear some of the people talk about today, the, the challenges that South Africa had then uh, in the early uh, 1990s and what they have now, uh, some of the things that are still very uh, much a part of it. Uh, when uh, Mandela was elected, there were thousands uh, of South Africans who came from the bushes uh, and came from the villages and came into the, uh, uh, many of the communities uh, to be part of it. And there was no housing. Everyone thought that Mandela was going to give housing, jobs, education, all these things that he didn't have resources to do. Uh, and he went around the world trying to get resources. He got some, but it, 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 it was a very big challenge. Uh, but I, I think uh, when you think about somebody in leadership and what he's able to do, uh, no one can uh, deny that he had a fundamental role in making South Africa uh, a great nation, a great country. Uh, and even now, uh, a place that people uh, are still uh, endeavoring to participate in. We have one microphone. Uh, it's to my right and to your left. Uh, and quite frankly, since we only have an hour, you should feel free, if you want to, to start lining up now if you have a question. Uh, be, um, because we, we're not going to have the time for all of them. We'll stop uh, right at 1. Uh, and then uh, turn the mics off. And if you want to come and talk to uh, the panelists, I have not consulted with any of them, but I promise you they will all be here after one, whether they agree with me or not. Right? So we'll see. So let, let's start now with a little sense of reflections on Nelson Mandela. Uh, and they'll each have five minutes to present 
uh, and then we'll open it up for questions from you uh, as well. Right. Well, um, <coughs> thank you so much, uh, Professor Ogletree. And I want to start by thanking the law school, and particularly Din Mino and her team, for putting this together. Uh, my name is Aminu Gamawa. I'm a lawyer, and I work on the area of uh, conflict resolution. I'm an SJG uh, candidate here, and uh, I, I will say that uh, as an African, I feel particularly honored that we are doing this in honor of somebody that many of us in Africa regard as a role model. Um, what scares me the most is um, at Mandera's funeral, every African leader was there, and everyone, including the dictators, said that he is their role model. <laughs> and, and, and I was, I was, I, I was, I said, what, what is it about this man? Everyone you meet, those who believe in violence, those who believe in non-violence, those who oppress their people, those who work in the interest of their people, everyone says that I'm looking up to this man. And I haven't met Mandela personally, but I read his book, and I read his work, and I have been uh, looking up to him. He's a lawyer, I am a lawyer, and he's somebody that I always wanted to be like when I grow up. And that is why, particularly, the focus of my work in Nigeria has been uh, trying to promote cross-cultural dialogue across followers of different uh, religions and members of different ethnic groups. Um, the question today is not about whether violence is good or bad. I think I would have answered that question with no. Violence is bad. I am against violence, and uh, if I have a way of avoiding it, I will always avoid it. But I think the question is a little tricky, which is, is it ever justifiable to use violence in support of social or political cause? I think the temptation is to say no, but after reflecting on different historical events from the French Revolution, uh, which laid down different ideas that we celebrate today, to the American Revolution, which also laid down uh, a political system that is celebrated globally, and to various independent struggles globally by different groups, you realize that um, in retrospect, uh, those who use violence actually are now being celebrated. But for every one or two, two examples you will cite of instances where violence was used to accomplish a particular political or social goal, you can cite 50 more examples where violence has produced more evil, more damage than good. And that is why I think Mandela's experience in South Africa is something that is worth studying and worth reflecting uh, upon. Uh, Mandela has set a, a precedent. As you rightly mentioned, there, are, there were a, a lot of expectations mm -hmm. that he's going to wave the magic wand and change everything. Uh, he's going to now um, uh, avenge on behalf of the black people for the operation that they have suffered all uh, the years. I personally think that um, um, uh, Mandela is a pragmatist. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he knows uh, uh, the limit of violence. It's not that he has never thought of using violence in his life. I mean, he has received military training um, uh, at a point in their effort to fight the uh, repressive, oppressive regime of apartheid in South Africa. He has traveled to many countries, including my country, Nigeria, to Algeria, to East Africa, to meet different leaders, and even to think of arming the ANC. But, but they realize that violence has its limits and they came with better options on how to approach things. And for me, um, I think his success in um, uh, uh, turning the system that has been globally uh, uh, condemned as, uh, as repressive uh, to what it is now as a model to many countries, people look at South Africa's political uh, victory of, over apartheid as an example of how nonviolence can be used to achieve success. I, I think it's something that is uh, really um, um, a, a good story, and is Mandela is somebody that is worth uh, uh, studying. 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> so I would like to use my 30 seconds to say that um, I personally think that uh, violence should be avoided. Mandela will always avoid violence, and I think that has been his body language um, uh, for two reasons. You will never use violence without dehumanizing your victim, and at the end of the day, dehumanizing yourself. And in an effort to justify violence, 
you also resort to dehumanizing your victim. And I believe that we have many tools, multiple tools that can be used to restructure the society politically and socially without resorting to violence. That has been my um, an approach and I think it has not failed me uh, from uh, Central African Republic to Syria to Liberia to Rwanda. We have seen the evil and we have seen the damage that violence does to our collective humanity, and I think there are better options. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Kara? Thank you, Professor Ogilvy and, and the law school. Uh, my name is Carrie Chance, and I teach in the, in the anthropology department here. The question of violence as a means for social change brings into stark relief that there are many Nelson Mandela's, the passive resistance activist, the militant revolutionary, and the constitutionalist, only to name a few. Each of these figures suggests multiple mythic and embodied meanings of Mandela, and in turn, multiple meanings of violence in South Africa, where I focus my comments. In 1946, as a young lawyer, Mandela defended the poor people's movement, Sofe Sonke, the We Die Together campaign, and their illegal land occupations. After his Gandhian-inspired defiance campaign in 1952, Mandela helped form Nkonto Isizwe, the spear of the nation, the military wing of the African National Congress. In his famous Ravonia trial speech, the last he would make before spending 27 years in prison, he reveals his views of violence as complex and historically contingent. Quote, after a long and anxious assessment of the South African situation, we came to the conclusion that as violence, in, as violence in this country was inevitable, it would be unrealistic and wrong for African leaders to continue preaching peace and nonviolence at a time when the government met our peaceful demands with force. It was only when all else had failed, when all channels of peaceful protest had been barred to us, that the decision was made to embark on violent forms of political struggle. We did so not because we desired such a course, but solely because the government had left us no other choice. The time comes in the life of any nation when there remains only two choices, submit or fight. That time has now come to South Africa. We shall not submit and we have no choice but to hit back by all means in our power to the defense of our people, our future, and our freedom. Mandela's speech interrogates the difference between justified and unjustified violence, both on the part of the race-based state and anti-apartheid movements. He proposes by interrogating, by critically positioning toward, taken for granted and legally enshrined, meanings of violence that make up the very fabric of society. In this spirit, we might ask here, what do we mean by violence? What is good violence and what is bad violence? Who, what, and where is associated with bad violence? And what are the causes of violence? Social scientific scholarship in the last 30 years has tended to focus on the effects of violence, its moral quandaries as pertaining to the law, language, and justice, and its subjective experiences as pertaining to identity, power, and resistance. Mandela's Rivonia trial speech prefers to emphasize the structures, processes, modes of consciousness, and geographical sites that enable and disable an analysis of violence founded upon the means and the causes of relations of force. To this end, he asks us to investigate the enduring types of violence that manifest in wounds and the absence of wounds, which are sutured onto the body, the social, the psychic, the cultural, and the banality of everyday life. He challenges us to rethink when peace becomes a force of violence. When is violence an instrument of liberation? Serenity in a war zone, love in the midst of hate, freedom in a jail cell, and nonviolence as a form of violence. Along with capturing the unresolvable plurality of Mandela's legacy, interrogating the means and causes of violence in the wake of his death shows up some of the contradictions of South Africa as a globalized liberal democracy. Almost 20 years after the fall of apartheid, with one of the most progressive constitutions in the world, South Africa remains one of the most unequal societies, with an unemployment rate at 30%, millions living without formalized housing, and a top-ranking Gini coefficient that reflects a yawning gap between rich and poor. From street protests to labor strikes to xenophobic pogroms, dissatisfaction with current socioeconomic conditions is being expressed through urban unrest, particularly in townships and track settlements, amongst those who still struggle to make life viable and secure. These protests have been condemned and met with routine violence by police and private security forces, including the arrest, torture, and killing of activists. 
The criminalization of popular forms of politics that were foundational to South Africa's celebrated democratic transition has raised the question yet again in poor communities of what is meant by violence and its relation to social change in this historical moment, whether on the part of the state, corporations, international institutions, or activists past and present. Only now there is no common political enemy, no repressive laws to overturn, and no unified organizational banner under which to imagine a certain future. 15 seconds. And yet, at a time when the inheritance of apartheid and colonialism combine with forces of globalization and economic liberalization, as analyses of violence tor turn toward the socioeconomic in South Africa and elsewhere, activists continue to claim Mandela such that he may still contribute to something entirely new. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Susan Farbstein, and I'm an assistant clinical professor at the law school and one of the directors of the International Human Rights Clinic. Um, so first, I think I should say that my answer to this question of when violence is justified is based on asking a lot more context-specific questions. Who's using the violence? What is the social and political change that they're seeking to achieve? How and why was the decision made to opt for violence? What kind of violence is being used? Who is being targeted? What was the precipitating event? What other options have been ruled out? What are the peripheral effects of this violence? And if I'm being honest, there's part of me that's very much drawn to the response of the pacifist. There's part of me that very much wants to say, no violence is ever justified in struggles in a transition from one kind of regime to another, that violence, as we've already heard, is bound to have a dehumanizing effect, and that it's also likely to have a negative impact on the society that emerges. But ultimately, I think that that answer is probably not totally satisfying, that we may have to face the reality that sometimes there are governments that are just so cruel, so evil, so unjust that people may need to resist by force. And my concern in those contexts is that insistence on nonviolence might sometimes lead to greater injustice, that in some circumstances, force might be the last way to appeal to dignity and to human rights. So with that said, I want to focus my time on exploring a bit um, the justifications that were given by the ANC when it decided to turn towards armed struggle and abandon 49 years of nonviolence. Because it seems to me like if ever you could justify a decision to turn to violence, it would be in a context like apartheid South Africa. So to take um, three of those justifications, the first one is that, of course, the cause was just, that apartheid itself was a crime against humanity, that you're talking about a systematic regime of oppression, of racial segregation, whose very purpose is to ensure the white majority has control over all <coughs> kinds of power, um, wealth, resources, politics, and that the black majority is oppressed and has essentially no rights. And then apartheid as a crime against humanity is enforced by numerous other international crimes and violations <laughs> ranging from um, exile, arbitrary arrest and detention, through extrajudicial killings and torture. So you have a situation in which the rule of law is totally absent, in which there's no meaningful recourse to the courts, in which the legal system is actually perpetuating the crime. So to me, I find this justification fairly convincing. If, if Nazi Germany is sort of the paradigmatic example of a situation in which violence may be justified, apartheid South Africa is a very close second. Um, a second justification that was given at the time was that the turn to violence was a last resort, that it was necessary, that it was self-defense. Um, and I think especially in the wake of the Sharpeville massacre, that that, um, that was really a turning point. Tutu said about Sharpeville, it told us that even if we protested peacefully, we would be picked off like vermin and that black life was of little consequence. So prior to Sharpeville, I think you have all of the state institutions sort of compressing the arena in which the ANC could operate legally. Um, after Sharpeville, you have a total shutting down of those possibilities. The ANC is banned, a state of emergency is imposed. So I can understand how at that time, um, the turn to violence would have seemed imperative. We already had um, Carrie give us the, the love we, the quote from the Rivonia trial, um, and I think Mandela was clear that there was no other means in order to secure the future and the freedom that was desired. Linked to this sort of um, 
last resort necessity argument was another argument about needing to give some kind of coherence to the violence. I think that there was a concern that civil war was about to break out, that it was going to be a racially fueled civil war, and that it was going to make it infinitely harder to create the racial harmony that was so desired. So the idea was that the ANC could channel that violence towards the apartheid state itself and perhaps away from individuals, be they black or white. I find this justification slightly less persuasive in part, in part because I think about sort of the strategic gains and losses and the effectiveness or lack of effectiveness of the violence itself. I think there's a fairly good argument to be made that at certain points the turn to violence was actually counterproductive, that the sabotage and bombing campaigns might have actually weakened the movement overall because the entire movement could then be treated by the apartheid government as if it was all violent, it was used to um, justify even more repressive crackdowns. It cost the AMC some support at home and abroad. And I think perhaps more seriously, it turned, at least for a time, the ANC's attention away from other options like boycotts, like strikes, like the ungovernability campaign that I think eventually led to apartheid's demise. 15 seconds. Uh, okay. A third justification that I will just flag had to do with the nature and degree of the violence. Mandela was always very clear that if violence was used, it should only be sabotage, um, that innocents should never be targeted, that government installations should be targeted. Um, Again, ultimately, I find that justification somewhat problematic. Of course, the apartheid government was responsible for more violence and for absolutely grotesque violence, but we also know that civilians were killed in acts of sabotage. We know that there were horrific abuses in ANC camps. Um, we know the ways suspected informants inside of South Africa were treated gruesomely. So where does all of this leave us? I think that ultimately it leaves us with a somewhat unsatisfying conclusion. On the one hand, any means were necessary and justified to end apartheid. On the other hand, I worry seriously about the legacy of all of this violence 20 years after apartheid's end. We can talk more about the sense in which violence has become, if not a norm, at least all too commonplace in South Africa today. So maybe a follow-up question that we want to ask ourselves is, if sometimes violence is justified or at least used in struggles for social and political ways, is there any way to minimize the damage that's done? Thank you. The time is precise and limited, unfortunately, and that's why I'm cutting folks off. Uh, and we hope that uh, you'll keep this in mind as you ask your questions, that there will be really thoughtful questions. And a phenomenal question is one that has no more than eight words. Uh, and <laughs> so start working on it right now. I have a very short question. Let's have our uh, fourth speaker. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is McConnell. <coughs> Um, I'm an SJD. I'm from Ethiopia. So when I first received this question, my initial thought was that violence is always wrong. Uh, it is warranted only in uh, criminal self-defense or necessity, as we know it in criminal law. Social and political goals can never justify violence. That was because uh, violence is disruptive, painful, etc. But after some reflections, I thought, this is a very difficult question. Uh, I'll tell you about two cases in the context of Ethiopia that I know. Uh, the first case is about a woman. Uh, as I recall from reading of the case, the, she murdered, the woman murdered her husband, and she was accused of um, uh, homicide. The husband was uh, beating, regularly beating her husband, her wife, uh, he was, his, his wife was abusive, etc. On the day of the incident, he was, he was abusive as always. He has been as abusive as always. Uh, he put off the light, locked the doors, and left her with no way out to, to, to leave the house. So she grabbed a tool that she found at her disposal. Uh, she knocked, struck him on the head, he died. And the court decided it was self-defense. So this is a case of exercise of violence against abuse. We all accept and we all agree with that. And the second case is about an incident that happened about seven years ago. The government found uh, oil and the gas reserve in a remote Ogaden region. And you know, the people in this area are uh, nomadic, cattle herding people. They depend on land for livelihood. A foreign oil, oil company won concession agreement and they started extraction. But nobody knew about this case until BBC reported on February 24, 2007, saying, I quote, 
rebel gunmen have killed at least 74 people in attack on an oil field in Ethiopia's remote Somali region. And it further quotes, Ethiop so the OLF spokes uh, spokesperson says, Ethiopian troops had been forcing nomadic tribes to leave their, edge, their traditional grazing area because of what had, because of that, we had to take action. So this second case is controversial, whether rebels or representatives of communities should exercise violence against government policy to extract oil from some region. It is not clear. The government proceed, uh, promised to prosecute this, the perpetrators of the violence, and I believe the court and the many other people, I, I think, would treat this case as the case of aggravated homicide or maybe even terrorism. But the more I thought about this, the difference, these two cases and the, the question of violence in, uh, in uh, pursuance of social and political change in general, the more I think the, the line between what is legitimate violence and what is not legitimate violence is blurred. How is a woman's action different from the actions of the OLF? From the Ogadeni community's point of view, the government is enforced dispossession of livelihood is violent and it warrants violent resistance. So for, from their point of view, we should not think of it as some sort of bad development decision. Just because you know, the violent effects of the dispossession of land is silent or not visible to us. The media did not report about the oil deal and the extraction decisions until there was a violent and noisy, loud, violent effect, which you know, um, resulted in the uh, killing of the oil employees. So about talking about more general things, we know repressive regimes exercise violence through laws, through army, police, court, and, and media. Uh, they suppress freedom of expression through censorship and other crude technologies of diminution. In the case of Ethiopia, I know any serious political dissent is not tolerated. The state often under, you know, under the facade of law and the court is violate individuals and the communities who stand against unjust policies. Journalists who criticize official laws and official, uh, officials and official laws, communities who resist repressive policies are persecuted. So I don't think in the second case, the case of the Ogaden, uh, the oil uh, extraction policy case, they could have resisted the unjust policy uh, through nonviolent means, because nonviolent means that street demonstrations or litigation or social you know, mobilizations require minimum degree of freedom. So in the absence of those freedoms, there are just no options other than violence. However, the life and teaching of Nelson Mandela teaches that there are stronger reasons to have faith in nonviolent means to pursue social and political change. We know some of the most durable social and political changes are made through nonviolent means. 30 seconds. So I will conclude with just uh, one point, with what I think. Um, so after thinking about these this, uh, cases, specific cases, um, as long as there is a symmetry of power and a symmetry of you know, capacity to exercise freedom to be heard, <coughs> we cannot exclude the possibility of legitimate exercise of violence. We need to judge every case. I agree with the idea that we need to judge every uh, case of violence in the context uh, based on case by case. We need to pay more attention to the disruptive effects of violence and cooperate with victims of violence of all forms, silent violence in the form of suppressive, uh, repressive policies, as well as noisy you know, violence as we see in the media. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Kennedy. Um, thank you very much. I um, feel very pleased to be part of any commemoration of uh, Nelson Mandela. In my view, Nelson Mandela was the most remarkable politician of the uh, last, in the last hundred years. Just an absolutely extraordinary person. I think it's especially nice that we 
are here celebrating Nelson Mandela because, of course, Nelson Mandela was a lawyer. And um, I think that um, people in legal education should um, focus on that. Um, another reason why I'm very pleased to be part of a commemoration of Nelson Mandela, Nelson Mandela was an African. And in the modern world, uh, Africans and people of African descent generally have been amongst the most um, vilified of the peoples in the world. And at this moment, around the world, there is probably no person who is more honored than Nelson Mandela. And I think that's a, just sort of a, a noteworthy conjunction that this African has been honored in this way um, around the world. On the issue, when, if ever, is violence justifiable in struggles for political or social change, I really don't have much more to say than what my colleagues have said. Uh, no one is for violence. Violence is um, usually, you know, well, violence is a, is, a, is a terrible thing, the deployment of violence. Um, my answer to the question would be, however, that violence is justifiable um, when one can confidently predict that the violence that one is deploying will eliminate a greater evil. That's always a very difficult judgment uh, to make. Uh, one has to consider a wide variety of things. Again, many of, him, many of them have already been mentioned. You know, one reason why people, even in the most terrible of circumstances, don't resort to violence is because the resort to violence would lead to suicide, essentially be suicidal. Uh, if you are a, you know, if you're in an oppressive uh, situation, uh, your oppressors typically have um, more access to uh, the means of violence than you do. So just, you know, self-preservation will lead one often not to engage uh, in violence. Another issue that has been mentioned, and I think it's one that maybe we, I, th I hope that in question and answer we will talk about, because violence is um, uh, a tainting thing, one always has to consider, even, even, if, even if one thinks that one can prevail, what will be the price that one pays for doing that? And in South Africa today, with respect to so many issues, with respect to the questions of, well, with respect to a wide variety of issues, it seems to me that the, the discussion of how South Africa achieved its liberation um, it's a vexed issue because, of course, South Africa remains a terribly scarred country with uh, very deep problems that it must confront, even though Nelson Mandela was uh, a wonderful leader and even though the apartheid regime was overthrown, uh, South Africa still faces deep problems and some of those problems are probably traceable uh, to the mechanisms by which apartheid was overthrown. With that, I think I'll subside. Thank you. Thank you. L let me, I'm going to ask uh, uh, two very short questions as people line up to ask their questions to the panel. Anybody can answer them. When we talk about violence, everybody seems a little bit schemish about it, uh, but it seems like it is part of our culture. Uh, and, uh, and I'm wondering, when we think about uh, the patriots uh, fighting against the British uh, as part of the liberation uh, of the United States, when we think about uh, the Palestinians fighting for territory against the Israelis, uh, there's violence. And when we think about the United States using drones, uh, you know, is that violent? It, it is, right? Because it kills people uh, and, and destroys things. Uh, are people squimish about violence, or is that a re reality and a necessity of where we are today in order to preserve who we are uh, leading to tomorrow? Uh, anybody want to respond? Just one little thing. I think one ought to be careful about assuming where one stands with respect to um, one's allegiances. Um, I was for the Tories, and uh, <laughs> 
I wish King George had prevailed <laughs> against the, uh, the patriots. It seems to me a very strong argument could be made that, in fact, the United States of America was not, the colonies were not justified in taking up arms against King George. It's, I think that Nelson Mandela and his com compatriots were justified in taking up arms against apartheid, but I don't say the same thing about the so-called American patriots. See, Dean, we need to have uh, two weeks on this discussion, <laughs> not an hour. We're just warming up, just warming up. Uh, Other comments? Sure. So uh, on the drone issue, I I've always been against violence. But recently, something happened in the place where I grew up, uh, in northern Nigeria. A violent group called Boko Haram emerged, and their goal is to kill innocent civilians conquer territory and impose their own version of political and social system on the people. The people disagree with them. They fight the people, they fight the government. The government set up a committee in Nigeria to dialogue with them and if possible, reintegrate them back into the society. They rejected dialogue. They rejected non-violence, peaceful means of resolving disputes. They are located in an area that shares border with different countries. They group their form and alliances, including with dangerous international terrorist organizations. And their goal is to kill anyone that disagrees with them. And just this morning, in the, in the, where the school that I attended, and the city where I spent most part of my adult life, was attacked by them, was attacked by them, and at a point, the people were sympathetic, saying that these are part of us, only that they have uh, this twisted understanding of religion, twisted understanding of how to solve political and social problems. We shouldn't kill them. We should try to engage them. We should try to dialogue with them. They are not interested. What do you do? Do you continue to beg someone who is bent on killing you? And uh, how do you approach that issue? I mean, is, I saw the letter written by Gandhi to Hitler, pleading with him that he shouldn't start the war. When he started the war, pleading with him to end the war. He didn't listen. And um, uh, the US had to intervene, others had to intervene, and then the war ended after a horrific violence. So the question is, and I agree with Professor uh, Ronald Kennedy, sometimes you have to make calculation uh, is cost-benefit analysis. That, that, I, I, I like uh, quoting things. This is the very dirty quote, but I will say it nevertheless. It is only when a mosquito lands on your testicles that you know that there are other non-violent way of solving problems. <laughs> <laughs> have to do cost-benefit analysis sometimes <laughs> when, when, when you are dealing with, with, with wine. That, that's what I would say. Mosquitoes. OK. Gotcha. 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 Woo. OK. Other comments? Um, it's, hard, it's hard to follow that. Um, but uh, I mean, I think what I, as an anthropologist, would always emphasize is um, you know, the, the socially and historically contingent qualities of violence. I mean, we do have to ask why it is that um, when the, whenever the word violence is used, it's always in a, a kind of negative uh, light. So why is it that Mandela, as a um, militant revolutionary, is so often vilified, um, but as prisoner is, is raised to a pedestal? Um, and it's a challenge in thinking about figures like Mandela um, and others like Che Guevara and Gandhi, Martin Luther King, um, uh, to, re to rethink violence caught between these, um, these kind of categories of repugnance and attraction, injury and intimacy, um, war and peace, and between love and hate. Um, so I would, I would emphasize the, the historical and, and social contingencies of violence. Okay. Any other comments on that question? Uh, one other question. Uh, a lot uh, here in the United States has been influenced by what happened 9-11, uh, September 11th. Uh, uh, and I was actually just in South Africa for a conference on racism uh, just a couple of days before all of this happened. Uh, is there a sense that 
violence is with us now. That is, that it may not be as remote as we thought it was. It's not the British coming to take us over, but the whole idea that it's different. Uh, it could be at a uh, cafe, out, cafe outside. It can be uh, public housing. The whole idea was this economic violence in September 11th, but the whole idea is that are, are we prepared that we may be, we, I'm talking about the United States, may be at risk of violence uh, like we were in September 11th? Is that a thing that you worry about, think about, write about, talk about? Is that a, a real fear? So I guess um, putting on my um, human rights clinic hat for a mm -hmm. moment, in, in the circles that I run in, I think people are much more concerned with what the response has been to 9-11 than with the violence that was perpetrated on that day. Sort of the, the question of what has been done and what is being done in our name is what occupies a lot of the people who I, who I work with. Um, so I think that while perhaps for many of us there is somewhere in the back of our minds a concern, what if there is another 9-11, what if there is another terrorist attack on U.S. soil, I think um, the, the overriding concern these days or the concern that I think many people wish Americans were more focused on is what was the response? How have people's human rights been taken away for a greater good? Um, what has been done in our names? Okay. Can I, can I say something? If, 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 I, I will tell you the truth. As somebody who speaks not as an a, a privileged American or privileged person from the global north, but as somebody who has spent his life working with people in the global south, uh, you know better than I do, the world has never been so unequal economically than it is now. Things are structured to favor certain people. It has always been like that. But I think the growing gap between the rich and the poor at macro and micro level and the dissatisfaction actually that the poor people are expressing globally is one of the reasons why we should be concerned about uh, uh, the potential use of violence. It has always been that there are people who want to retain the status quo and they are willing and ready to use violence to ensure that they protect their privileges. And there are people who want to see change. They have an alternative world, or they may not even have an alternative world view, social and political, but they are against what exists. If we look at the current structure, economically, the violence, the economic violence, and I like that, uh, I think it's sometimes even more damaging than the physical violence we see. And you cannot talk, in most cases, about physical violence without really looking at the underlying causes, and mostly, they have to do with the political structure and economic structure that we have globalized. The neoliberal idea of privatizing everything, of um, pr making certain few individuals rich, has actually made the poor poorer and the rich richer. And I will give you Nigeria as an example. You read on daily basis on news that uh, most of the emerging economies in the world are in Africa. Nigeria is one of the fastest growing economy. Uh, it has one of the largest producers of oil in the world, and it is like the future of Africa. But you go to Nigeria, you go to certain places, you realize that all the benefits <coughs> goes to certain few parts of the country or few individuals. And then you begin to ask now, what happened to the overwhelming majority who are poor and angry? Mm -hmm. And there is another saying which says that, um, one day, the poor will have nothing to eat but the rich. And, and <laughs> when that day comes, I think it's, it's just, it, it, it's, it's not going to be good for us. And, and I think every violence you think of can be associated with dissatisfaction. It's not as irrational as we may sometimes tend to present it. Sometimes there is some, we may disagree with the rationale, but certainly behind every violence and behind every revolt, there are some legitimate grievances, perhaps, not articulated properly, perhaps uh, because they have been pushed into a corner, and uh, they say it where, where there's another saying, when the only tool you have is hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And, and that's, that's what happens to people who are uh, not educated, uh, not empowered, and then oppressed. The only tool they have of expressing their revolt is to use violence. And I think that is 
what we should be focusing on, in my opinion. Let, let, oh, go ahead, okay, Karen. Uh, Karen, you want to make a quick response? And I want to I want to ask sure. a final question. And if anybody has questions, make sure if you line up that microphone. I mean, I would I would just like to add because I think it's connected to both the South African case and. Um, the United States in a time of the war on terror, um, which is that the question of who draws that line between violence and nonviolence, criminality and politics, um, particularly under conditions of liberalization and under post-colonial conditions, is, is, is radically um, thrown into question. The categories are quite often blurred. So for instance, a debate that's going on in South Africa now is whether um, burning barricades in the streets is violence. The state says it's violent. Uh, the protesters say it's nonviolence. Um, in under apartheid, uh, blowing up power substations as part of the MK activities was considered terrorist activities. Um, the the uh, the ANC considered it um, somewhere between violent and nonviolent activities. In the same vein, um, you know, to what extent U.S. drones is named as violence and by whom. Um, it is also thrown into question. And when terrorist activities come to the fore, you know, movements and insurgencies, in other words, are, are challenging, challenging us to radically rethink our, our understandings and analyses of violence. Let, let me just ask uh, each of the panelists before we go to the audience that uh, you can answer with a phrase or multiple phrase, but I want each of you to say something uh, uh, as we talk about Mandela. How would you name him now. Is he a patriot? Is he a terrorist? Is he a liberation fighter? Uh, is he a leader? Uh, is he violent? What, what comes to mind when you want to describe Nelson Mandela? I'll start with Professor Kennedy, and then we'll go to the questions in the audience. He was a great statesman. Okay. I, I think he was a liberator. Okay. I would say he was a liberator who embodies the spirit of reconciliation and forgiveness. I think he was a hero of black popular politics. Yeah, he's a lawyer, a politician, and a liberator. You know, it's interesting. No one said that, uh, you know, he was a murderer. Uh, no one described him as someone uh, fighting for uh, liberation of people of African descent in South Africa. It's very interesting because if you look at how he's defined today, if you listen to CNN, you know, he's everything that you describe. If you listen to Fox News, he's everything that you haven't described, <laughs> right? Yeah. And uh, it, neither is wrong, I think. I think it, it, it's all how you look at him that makes a big difference. And we'll find out from our questions. First question. Um, thank you for the thought-provoking panel. <clears throat> I think my question um, uh, ties into what Professor Ogletree was, was going to, which is it's sort of a question about the panel and the acceptability of even having this discussion if holding all things con co uh, constant, um, but sort of uh, uh, changing the fact that Mandela had tried to nationalize um, um, uh, some industries, say the diamond industry or the mining industry or whatever, or tried to redistribute, would we even ha be having uh, an event at the Harvard Law School and sort of, you know, uh, you know, uh, accepting that he said things that were violent, sort of forgetting about his Marxist path, or if, if you know, it, it was a question of, of, of redistribution or nationalization, which would have disproportionately affected uh, the white minority in South Africa, this kind of discussion would not even be plausible in a law school or, you know, four days ago, um, you know, in, a, in, a, in Sanders Theater. So it's just a question. Response, yep. I don't think that's true. I mean, um, um, you know, I think people know that Nelson Mandela, for instance, embraced Fidel Castro. People know that Nelson Mandela viewed himself as a revolutionary. I think people know that Nelson Mandela, had he had more force, would have probably imposed a different uh, you know, set of requirements for reconciliation. I mean, the fact of the matter is the uh, African National Congress did not have the power to overthrow their masters, and so they had to make do. Um, you know, I mean, I think, I think people are aware of that. I mean, in a, in a way, Nelson Mandela was, be because of the weakness, the military weakness, 
of his forces um, you know, had to engage in a reconciliation that has still left the great masses of uh, black South Africans in a very, you know, in a, in, in a terrible situation. I, I mean, I, I think people, many people know that. It's, it's, it's true that after his death, there was, you know, in, in, in a lot of precincts, a sort of a whitewashing of Nelson Mandela. But I mean, that, you know, that often happens. Any other comments on that question? Well, I was wondering, maybe that would have made him more like Mugabe, uh, except that Mugabe, you know, stuck in power for more than 20 years and those things. Right. Next question. So thank you all for hosting this event. My question is, what determines the message that violence sends? For example, the violent actions of the ANC against a very illegitimate government arguably cost them quite a lot of legitimacy to their audience, whereas right now in the Ukraine, <coughs> there's violence which is killing police officers, yet they seem to be hailed as freedom fighters. Anybody want to comment? Well, is uh, I think the, the somebody's uh, terrorist is somebody's hero. I think um, usually the wall is structured in such a way that um, it's not actually the legitimacy of your violence that, that, that gives you recognition or acceptance, but largely in our contemporary situation has to do with what the media, there are people who are committing violence, but the media don't even pay attention to cover their violence or their message to the whole world. And I think um, in the case of Ukraine and in the case of uh, ANC, uh, the, the fact that um, if the U.S. doesn't support your violence, uh, I think the media would always find a way of framing it in such a way that it will look uh, illegitimate and, and, and not nice. And I think the world has always been like that. Information is power. And um, that idea of spreading message about your cause, either social or political, has to do with how much access you have to the media. And, and I think um, um, it shows the hypocrisy in the global system itself. I, I think it, there's no shame in acknowledging that. I think we, we have people with legitimate causes, but because of certain global political interests, geopolitical interests, actually their own cause has been relegated to the background or has been twisted. So Fox News will give it a different meaning, CNN will give it a different meaning, largely because that perhaps that violence or that message has a tendency of disrupting certain economic interests multinational corporate interest in those countries and the rest. Uh, back to your question, I still agree with you that had Mandela, what Mandela secured for South Africa that made him a hero is basically the political revolution of overthrowing appetite. But when it comes to economic, and there is an economic violence going on now, I think to that extent, he hasn't done what he himself, I think, has acknowledged the limitations. And I want to say that Mandela... Uh, has never presented himself as a perfect human being. Uh, he knew his shortcomings, and I think it will also be a disservice to his legacy to present him as this perfect human being who has done everything. And I believe that uh, in continuation of his legacy, uh, we should continue to fight for his original vision, which is to have a more equal, more just South Africa. Somebody mentioned something, and this will be my last uh, comment. Had Mandela disrupt the global economic system so much, he wouldn't have been celebrated so much by the people who attended his, his, his funeral. I, I'm not sure about that, but I think there are some elements of truth to that uh, statement. And, uh, was there another question? Okay. It, it's very interesting because my, were you going to respond to that? Okay. I Go ahead. No, I can. Um, uh, no, just to add uh, very briefly, um, you know, Franz Fanon talked about the transformative qualities of, of violence. And in a context of political struggle like the one in South Africa, I mean, police officers are transformed into um, one's political enemy, um, to, into militants and soldiers. Um, and in, in that particular context, um, you know, we also have to see what transformative effects it has on, on the actors involved. And just to add a quick note on this question of economic uh, inequality, I mean, the, the debate about 
internationalization of the, mine, of the mines and other industries is still very much alive and well today. I mean, the rise of the economic freedom fighters um, who are contesting this year's national elections um, bring that very powerfully to the fore and also reflect on these kinds of questions about Fanon and the transformative qualities of violence. It's very interesting. We have to end pretty, pretty quickly. When you think about how do you label uh, a leader forever uh, and what kind of uh, uh, label do you put on him or her? And, and I, I think about Nelson Mandela and I, I agree with what Professor Kennedy said about his greatness, but I can completely understand how people can absolutely disagree with that. I wasn't a, uh -oh, uh oh, what did I do? <laughs> Oh, you said, okay, got it. okay, we, 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 oh, there we go again. Okay, let me finish my sentence uh, quickly. Uh, I, I grew up as a pacifist, uh, and I'm one who always opposed war, any kind of war, uh, and made that clear. I have three brothers. All three of them serve uh, this country uh, in the Air Force, all three, in, in one respect or another. And that means something, right? And I lost a lot of my pacifism uh, in 9-11. All of a sudden, uh, it was, we are being attacked. And, and I was one who was not, let me put it this way, thrilled or excited about George Bush. But I, he, was, he was my president uh, when he stood up in New York after thousands, people I knew, uh, had lost their lives, right? And, and so you, it becomes personal. And, and now I'm, I'm back to where I was, the pacifist, right? But, but the reality is that I think when we think about Nelson Mandela, uh, I, I think the reality is that he has to be labeled as someone who, coming from where he came from, uh, the, the humility of his uh, upbringing made an enormous amount of difference. And I do hope that not only can we have larger discussions about him, but uh, I'm convinced now I'm going to teach a course about him. I thought one about Obama, about everybody else. What about Nelson Mandela, right? Because I think that the, this generation has no idea sort of what it was like in South Africa, being born in South Africa, being a majority and being treated as a minority, and what you, the struggle you had to do. Uh, and I think that's going to be very significant. And I think that our panelists have uh, made that clear to us, that we have learned a lot, but we still have a lot to learn and a long ways to go. Thank you all for coming today and have a great day.